What's up, everybody, and welcome into another edition of The Sit Down, a crime and mafia podcast. Hope you're all having a great day, a great evening, wherever you are listening. Thanks for checking us out here. Another week, another episode. It is July 4th week coming up. I'm very excited. Uh, this will be episode 13. And what a, what, a, what a 13 weeks it's been. It's been fun doing this. And we got another great episode for you today. Uh, Going to go kind of a different way than we've went in the first 12 episodes. But, you know, I think when you talk about crime, when you talk about organized crime, um, and when you talk about just a lot of crime in general, you've got to talk about drug dealers and drug gangs. And we're going to do our first episode, and we're going to kind of involve these in as we go. Um, we're going to talk about a drug dealer and a drug gang today. Uh, a really, look, let's just be honest, a fascinating individual, probably the most dangerous person in the history of this state of uh, Pennsylvania. I think we could make a case might be the most, one of the most dangerous people in the federal prison system today. Would you agree with that blackjack? Probably today. Prisons were made for our, our subject today, weren't, weren't they? Uh, yes, uh, this is, you know, we, we do this show every week, Jeff, and we usually have a little bit of fun, right? Like, you know, so a lot of these guys we talk about, they're kind of colorful Light guys, heart, yeah. you know, they've got their moments where they're kind of doing some weird, wacky shit. There's nothing fun about this. This, this guy is a monster. He is literally the stuff that nightmares are made of. Like it's, it's, he is a terrifying individual. Yeah, and I think when we started the show, I knew we'd, we'd always do shows on, you know, John Gotti or, or Al Capone and, and people that individuals knew who they were. But you know, today's show is going to be someone that we're going to teach you about that you didn't know about. And um, this wasn't long ago that they were doing the things that they were doing. And I remember when we talked about the Philadelphia Black Mafia, that was a show you weren't on Blackjack. But we talked about me and my guest, Sean Griffin, we talked about how for years the Black Mafia was able to operate in Philadelphia because it was pretty simply the FBI didn't really know they existed. And I think when it comes to organized crime for a long time, the FBI has been so worried about Italians and other groups that they don't seem to understand that some of these drug gangs are particularly heinous, oh, yeah. particularly bad. Uh, and we're going to talk about a guy today called Cabani Savage. He truly had a fascinating name and he was a savage. It's that simple. Uh, he did things that when we talk about them, they're hard to discuss, frankly. Yeah, um, it absolutely is. You, you hit the nail on the head with the FBI, too, because when you when you research Cabone Savage, you will f see that, you know, this because we'll I'm sure we'll have people who say, you know, well, this isn't a mafia thing. This is every bit organized crime as any Italian family in New York has ever been. Yeah, because there was a distinct leader. There were distinct enforcers. There was a distinct person that handled the day-to-day -day operations. There were people on the street that uh, distributed the drugs. There was a given means to income. Um, there was things that went on. If you didn't basically get down or lay down, you would go. Uh, this is very much organized crime. And, you know, I've heard that. And, and I know when we, again, talked about the Black Mafia, there's a lot of people that will say you can't call – a group of black criminals, the mafia or whatever. It's an organized crime group. Okay. And Correct. we're going to kind of discuss the lengths that Kabani Savage would go to protect his organization himself. Uh, and um, we're going to get into some of his comments. Um, there's some chilling comments he made. Uh, what the FBI was able to do is bug his prison cell at one point. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to get to all that in a second, but before we get to that, we had a little news that we want to discuss. And, um, you know, it's not personal news or anything, but there's a pretty incredible trial going on right now over in Italy. Uh, and I spoke to Dante the Don, great blogger at Barstool, and I knew that he was someone I wanted to talk about this with just because I know he's very plugged into what's going on over there. So we interviewed him earlier today, and I'm interested in having you guys hear from him. And we just, Blackjack kind of talked about uh, this huge trial going on over there, over 300 people uh, are on the uh, on the docket here being discussed, really a transnational organization, one of the biggest organizations uh, as far as organized crime. And they put the American mob really to shame to what they're able to do over in Italy. So what we'll do now is we'll go to the Dante the Don interview. We'll come back. Uh, we had a great conversation. We talked about the Italian, the true Italian mafia and Drangetta. We also talked about the Irishman a little bit. Uh, and some things going on in the future. So check out our interview right now with Dante the Don. 
All right, welcome back to the sit down. Uh, that was the great Dante the Don. Great interview. Good talking to him. Really wanted to kind of get his kind of thoughts on what was going on. I know he's really plugged in over there. Uh, Black, do you know anything about what's going on over there with, with the Andrew and and how big they are? Yeah, I mean, it's the largest mafia trial in Italy in 30 years. Um, and I mean, when you just as, as a lawyer, when I read some of the, the uh, logistics of it, that the investigation is over 15,000 pages of evidence and over 24,000 hours of phone conversations recorded. I mean, those numbers are staggering, staggering numbers. This was a, a countrywide investigation that is just an unbelievable it's an unbelievable scope that they have here. This trial is expected to last a year. They're going six days a week, which, I mean, everyone yeah. knows Europeans. You know, we don't do that here. No. They generally don't do that <laughs> there. This is this this is probably the biggest trial I've ever seen in any – the biggest criminal trial I've ever seen anywhere. And you know what's sad, Blackjack? What? Nothing will affect the flow of drugs in this uh, on this planet by this going on nothing no, of course it won't and it's really just kind of plugging a hole as water spills out um you're never going to stop this because as we said in the interview other groups will become emboldened and they'll become the main proprietors and someone's then going to fill the void someone I mean, somebody, will fill the void yeah. there's too much money in it this is what the government and when i say the government i mean governments worldwide don't understand is that there is too much money in it somebody will step in and say the risk is worth the reward. Oh, sure it is. I mean, these are billion dollar businesses and, you know, Kabani Savage wanted a piece of that business and that's why he got into the drug trade. So let's get into probably, and I'm not even going to say probably, he is the most dangerous person in the history of the state. Uh, he is the only person in modern history uh, from Philadelphia to receive a federal death sentence. Uh, we're going to talk about Kabani Savage right now. So Sit back, relax. You're going to learn something today you didn't know. Uh, a truly chilling episode of the sit down. Let's get into Kabani Savage. Uh, Kabani Savage was born January 1st, 1975 uh, in Philadelphia. Um, he was born to Joe and Barbara Savage. Uh, and during Kabani's youth, uh, he grew up in uh, the Richard Allen Housing Projects. The Richard Allen Housing Projects are no longer around. Uh, they were situated in North Philly, just north of, uh, of Fairmont Avenue, uh, they took up basically a three square block. It was a housing project. And when it was created in the 40s, it was a great thing for, for you know, families in Philadelphia. But it quickly became into the 70s, 80s, 90s, a crime ridden neighborhood. Um, just a real eyesore, frankly. Uh, the Richard Allen homes were a bad place. Uh, they were just inundated with murder and prostitution and drug dealing and just as any housing project is, just a cauldron blackjack for, for bad things to go on. And you know, Kabani in his early years grew up there. And when he was growing up, his parents decided that they were going to get out of Richard Allen and they moved to an area of Philadelphia called Hunting Park. Uh, Hunting Park is in North Philly. It's up uh, to the north of Temple University, just south of Erie Avenue. Uh, and it's a pretty okay neighborhood, not necessarily now, but you know, they lived on a, tr uh, you know, a, a tree a block with, with plenty of trees on it was a nice little block nice row homes uh and coming up um it's kind of unclear what joe savage did uh, one thing we know that joe savage did kabani's father was he sold drugs um and he knew that you know it was tough to make ends meet in that neighborhood and in these neighborhoods without selling drugs and joe savage would have a lot of connections he was connected with a guy called bubby thomas gerald bubby thomas he was a big time drug dealer and when Kabani was 13, um, the family got some bad news. Uh, Kabani and his two sisters uh, learned that uh, their father, Joe, had cancer. And this hit Kabani particularly hard. Uh, any young man, uh, when his father gets sick, it's hard to see that. Uh, you don't ever want to see your dad in pain because he's the guy that raised you. And particularly in the black community, uh, Kabani needed his father. And his father helped him, I think, a long time. And he, his dad got sick, Blackjack, and, you know, really any kid, that really hits you hard, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've talked about it in past episodes with guys who have had, you know, troubled relationships with their fathers. And, and you know, it, it always, it's one of those relationships in life, Jeff, that like, you know, your father growing up is kind of your, 
you know, your idol, your role model as, as what a man is. And now all of a sudden he's laid low and eventually will, will pass away. And now, as you said, at 13 years old, two sisters and a mother, Kabani Savage is now the head of his family. And that's exactly what his father told him, you know, based on his deathbed, uh, which it's interesting because when he was sick, he actually decided to get a bed uh, and bring it home. And they kind of put it in their living room and he would kind of tell Kabani, look, you know, you're a young you're a teenager, but you're the man of the house now. You're my only son. Uh, you need to go out and do what you got to do. And I think Kabani took that as, you know what, um, you know, where I live, it's rife with bad things going on. I need to go out and get it. Like, you know, I've seen, you know, Bubby do and, and, and other people do. And uh, his father would pass away. Kabani would actually drop out of Frankfurt High School uh, as he went uh, as a teenager. And early on, he took up boxing. He was actually a pretty good boxer and he would actually fight professionally uh, one time. He fought one time down in Atlantic City uh, in the welterweight division. He actually won the fight. Uh, interestingly enough. So he kind of took on boxing. He went to the Front Street Gym, which is a pretty esteemed gym in this area. Uh, but all this, he he kind of continued to dabble in the drug trade. And he had a great mentor. For anyone that isn't from Philly, Bubby Thomas is a name that if you're familiar with the drug trade, people know. Uh, Bubby was doing a lot of stuff in North Philly. He had some connections, I believe, to the Philadelphia Black Mafia years ago. And he was supplying a lot of people with, with, with product in the surrounding areas and Kabani was kind of a young teenager and, and, and early twenties when his parents moved to, to, to Darien street, it's important to understand the landscape of Philadelphia at that point. And in North Philly, there were notorious drug corners and they've been written about, they've been, there's been videos about them. There was a corner one block away from Kabani's house, Ethan Butler. And Ethan Butler Street is probably the most notorious drug corner in Philadelphia for years. Uh, not necessarily anymore, but during the 90s, Ethan Butler was where you went to get product. Uh, and Kabani lived really close. He realized that that was the prized possession someday. And Kabani would start out selling PCP. And we've talked about PCP on this show uh, a little bit. Uh, PCP is a dangerous drug. Um, it is angel dust, which is what they call it on the street. But in Philadelphia, they call it wet. Um, And as you know, it causes hallucinations, this distorted view, you become violent. It's really an out of body experience, but it's cheap. It's easy to produce. You basically dip a marijuana cigarette into it uh, and lace it. And uh, it gives you a crazy high blackjack and it's incredibly addicting. Yeah. I mean, you'll never see people do things like you see people on PCP do. It it is you know, in, in my career, I've seen a lot of people do a lot of different drugs and PCP is some terrifying shit because like you said, the delusions are wild. It gives them almost a, a superhuman strength. The amount of energy that these guys have when they're on it is through the roof. It, it's, it's kind of the worst stuff that's out there. Yeah, I I know there are, you know, and and I've seen this on on different docs and things like that, that there are drug dealers that will not sell PCP because it's such a a dangerous drug. And, you know, Kabani had an interesting method for attaining PCP. What he would do is he would go to dealers that would steal drugs, right, that that would that would take drugs from people. Uh, He would find people that sold PCP and black. He would basically persuade them that the PCP they had was very low quality. And he would get people to believe him. He would then buy it for a bargain basement price and then sell it for a very high profit margin. And it was a particularly strong, he would actually keep the PCP in his home fridge at 3643 North Darien Street, where his mother lived uh, and they would sell PCP. And he realized that around his neighborhood, whether it was 8th and Pike, 7th and Pike, Franklin and Luzerne, all these places were really good spots to sell wet. And he would eventually graduate to selling powder cocaine. Then he would create crack and he would sell crack. And look, if you know anything about crack in the 80s and 90s, it was a heavily addictive thing. You could sell it for cheap. You only had a five minute high with crack. So it was something that people were buying tons of and you could get rich off it. And as Kabani knew, he had to provide for his family. Boxing wasn't taking off. It wasn't as lucrative as he thought. He had a good connect in Bubby Thomas. And he said, you know what? Dad wants me to get into the family business to provide. He ain't here anymore. I got to go out and get it. 
So he would um, also have a, an interesting way of creating a, a need for a drug. Uh, he would do what was called pump the corner. And I don't know if you know what pumping the corner is, but he would go to an assigned area that he would have around his, his home and he would give drugs out for free for two or three days. Yep. And you would develop a want. Yeah, you create a need. A supply, a demand, and then you would create a need for it and people would be addicted and they come back and you'd own a corner. Now, as I said at the time, Ethan Butler was the prized possession. Kabani knew that he had certain blocks already taken over, but if he could get Ethan Butler, he would literally control Hunting Park and would down the road control all of North Philly. I mean, you own three or four blocks, you're making a ton of money. Uh, the problem was Ethan Butler was owned by a guy called Tibius Flowers. Tib Flowers was a longtime drug dealer. He was a rival of Kabani. Kabani didn't like him. Tib didn't like Kabani. They were boxing partners. Uh, and they had kind of a disdain for each other. And one day, Kabani's coming up. He's someone in the neighborhood that people knew. So Tib knew who he was. And I think that's important to discuss, Blackjack. In Philadelphia, it's truly fascinating how you're – dealt with in a neighborhood that's not yours. People are always going to come and say to you, who are you? Why are you here? Okay. Mm -hmm. And up in that neighborhood, you know, they're always going to kind of try you, but people knew who Kabani was and they were going to, you know, they knew he could be trusted in a way. So he's up there in, in North Philly one day at Ethan Butler, a guy comes in a neighborhood, not connected to Tib or anything. He's just a random stranger. He had come up to to uh, to Ethan Butler. He knew someone in the area. He would frequent the area. This guy, Kenneth Lassiter. Yep. So Kenneth Lassiter comes up there one day. And Kabani's in one of his moods. Lassiter bumps Kabani's car as he's trying to park. And Kabani makes a big fucking deal about it. You fucking hit my car. You owe me all this money. Uh, now, Kabani had an ulterior motive to why he did all this. And we'll get to why he did it. But Kabani comes up to this guy and says, look, motherfucker, uh, you owe me money for this. And Lasser's saying, look, I didn't do anything. Your car's fine. Um, Kabani just could have walked away, and that was that. But Kabani keeps pushing it. You owe me money. Guy says, I don't have any money. Kabani turns around as there are witnesses. This is the middle of the day in Philadelphia. He looks around to his cohorts and says, does anybody know this dude? And Everybody's like, no, nobody knows who the fuck this guy is. Kabani pulls a gun out and shoots him and kills him right on the street. Yep. Now, Kabani was smart not to kill somebody in broad daylight, but Kabani knew that if a murder happened on that corner, the cops would be all over it. And that would take away from Tibbs' drug operation. And he knew that he could somehow muscle in by causing a panic around that neighborhood. They would all come to him. They would all love his product and they would want his product only. And Kabani knew that they weren't going to solve the homicide because no one was going to testify against him. The problem Kabani had was early on, he became pretty um, arrogant, frankly. Tib Flowers saw the murder. Okay. And Tib Flowers does kind of the unthinkable. Tib Flowers says, uh, I'm going to go to the police about this. So he contacts Philadelphia police and the court of common police sets up a murder charge against Kabani. Kabani gets arrested a couple of days later, uh, but he gets released on bail um, and goes back out on the street. Now, we have to remember about this trial because this would be an important thing that would come later. So Kabani takes care of, of Lasseter and Lasseter kind of dies for no reason, but he manages to kind of take over the corner in Ethan Butler. And by this point, Kabani owns four or five different blocks in Philadelphia. Uh, literally the whole block area around his home at Darien Street he owned. So Blackjack, he's making a ton of money. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's 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 on the come up here in a big way. I mean, this is a, a big rise. It's a big piece of of turf to have for him. And you know, as we're gonna talk about, he's gonna do whatever the hell it takes to protect it. Yeah, by 1999, Kabani had an organization set up. Uh, they called it the KSO, the Kabani Savage Organization. Uh, and he had just like any organized crime family, he had uh, people that were part of his group that uh, would carry out things. Um, basically, he had a guy, um, Stephen Northington, that controlled the street corners. He would supply them with drugs. He would take care of squabbles. He would take care of distribution. He kind of handled things on behalf of the organization on the street. 
he had three enforcers. One of them was Stephen Northington, and the other two were cousins, Robert Merritt and uh, Lamont Lewis. Lamont Lewis was Cabani Savage's chief enforcer. Poppy Eye, they called him. He was the sole uh, assassin. He would take care of big things that needed to be done. Also involved in this Borgata, uh, Blackjack was Kadada Savage. Kadada was uh, Kabani's younger sister. Uh, she had decided to follow her brother into the life, which you don't see much of. You don't see women generally in this line of work. Uh, but Kadada would handle uh, not only things on the street, but she kind of handled the business end of things. Uh, she would handle, uh, you know, when Kabani would go away or something, she would handle making sure people were paid. She would handle things with connects. Uh, she was kind of integral to the business as well. So it's interesting because if you've ever seen The Wire, so like Lamont Lewis and Robert Merritt were the Chris and Snoop of Marla Stanfield's organization, right? Yeah. Uh, and there was a guy, um, Monk, who handled all the distribution. Uh, that would be Northington. And they, they all had different job so it really was a mafia black chip because everyone had a title they weren't necessarily called consigliers or capos but everyone had a role in this organization yeah they certainly did i mean that's what i was saying at the top of the show is that this was as organized a group as you would see in any italian family in new york because you know and even down to the naming right i mean like you what did the, the bosses who founded these families do they named it after themselves it's cabani savage organization it's the same thing and yeah he knew that in order to be successful, he had to have layers. And he established them very clearly. Everyone knew what their role was. And again, you know, he didn't have any brothers. He didn't have any other male family members. So what did he do? He brought his own family in, which we've talked about plenty of times with the Italian mafia. That's what they do. They bring in sons or brothers or cousins. He had a sister, brought her in. It's the same thing. And we'll learn pretty quick that Kadada Savage was just as demented Oh, and yeah. cold and sociopathic as her older brother. Um, there was something that came over the Savage family, and I think a lot of it had to do with Joe Savage's passing. Um, but by 2000, Cabani's goal was to become the biggest drug distributor in the city. And not only was he selling drugs uh, at multiple blocks, he was now wholesaling drugs. So he was getting uh, large amounts of drugs from his connect, uh, a guy called Juan Rosado, uh, and he was supplying other dealers. He was now supplying his mentor, Bubby Thomas, with drugs. That's how big Cabani had gotten. He was supplying South Philadelphia with drugs. Do Dawood Bay, uh, uh, the Smith brothers, they were down in South Philly. They were being uh, given drugs by Cabani. And Cabani would also take care of people that weren't willing to get down or lay down because that was truly Cabani's uh, whole thing. You either get with us or you get laid the fuck down. It's pretty simple. Uh, and that would start pretty early. Uh, in 2000, uh, there was a guy in North Philly, Mansur Abdullah. Uh, he was a drug dealer. Uh, he was someone that was not willing to play ball. So Kabani said, fuck this guy. He's got to go. Let's set him up. Let's steal his drugs and kill him. So on August 2nd, 2000, uh, he has a new assassin, Kareem Bluntly and Lamont Lewis. They kill Abdullah. They steal his drugs. They shoot him in the head and burn his car uh, on the corner of his corner uh, in North Philly. And they burn his body, basically. Uh, that was the first real murder they could, they, they created uh, in this organization. They would also kill uh, other, other individuals that would either try to assassinate one of their own um, or whatever. In 2003... There was a guy, Barry Parker, who I guess for whatever reason thought he could take on the Kabani Savage organization. Uh, he decides to try to muscle in to one of the corners Kabani had created, 7th and Pike Street, 8th and Pike Street, just north of Kabani's house. Uh, Kabani wasn't going to let that happen. Uh, he would kill Barry Parker days later in February of 2003. So Kabani Blackjack was eliminating people that weren't willing to play ball like the mafia would. Uh, and he was taking control. He was creating a belief that he was dangerous. You don't fuck with him. Uh, and if you do fuck with him, you're going to be put in a body bag. Pretty simple. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, a very clear strategy for somebody who is relatively new. You know, I mean, he, he was around for a few years, obviously, but somebody who is trying to grow this thing quickly, he's sending a message. If, if you, if, you know, it's the old saying, right? If you, if you shoot at the king, you best not miss. And he, if you're going to come after him, you're going to go down. I mean, that was plain and simple. There was no, there was going to be any, uh, 
diplomacy involved here. If you came after his territory, you were going to get killed. Yeah, and look, by this point, they're making a ton of money. They're making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Kabani's buying stash houses. He's buying other property. He's buying cars. He's buying equipment. He's buying everything and everything to make himself uh, one of the largest drug dealers in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, he also buys a property at 3510 Palmetto Street, uh, which is right off Erie Avenue. Uh, it's right you know, just near the neighborhood. And that would be a location that... Interestingly enough, I believe it's for sale right now, uh, if you're interested in buying it. Uh, but this would be an important uh, location, 3510 Palmetto Street. It's actually an interesting uh, layout, Blackjack. It's on a street with basically a bunch of garages, and there's one house, one or two houses. And this would be where Kabani and his cohorts would package, distribute, and sell drugs out of. Uh, it was it was a it was a stash house drug house basically that's what it was and that was an important purchase because this will kind of go hand in hand with what we're about to talk about. Kabadi would also um, have an individual in his gang, Eugene Coleman. Coleman was uh, younger than most of the people in the group. Uh, I think Kabadi almost looked at him as a bit of a protege, if you will. Uh, they called him Twin. Twin Coleman was kind of a young up and comer. He was involved with this group. He actually lived above 3510 Palmetto. He lived in the top floor. The bottom floor was a drug depot, basically. So he would put his hard hat on, get his lunch ready, and head down and start manufacturing drugs. The problem Coleman has is there's an individual in the group that Kadata Savage finds out might be cooperating with the government, Tyrone Tolliver. Tolliver is a dealer himself. They think he's uh, cooperating against the organization. And Kabani realizes that Twin Coleman is green around the gills. He might be a little soft. Yep. He's not necessarily as cold-blooded as a lot of us are. He's never killed anybody. Remember when we talked about Tommy Patera, Blackjack, Frank Ganji? He had never killed anyone. He had never really done anything. So he was someone that you couldn't necessarily trust. And Patera sure realized that. That's exactly what Twin Coleman was. Coleman was... I think the Gabani up a comer, but they knew he was soft and they needed to implicate him in a murder. He was friends with Tyrone Tolliver and they decide Tolliver needs to go. So we'll get twin involved. We'll get him to lure Tolliver to the house and we'll kill him at that point. So on, uh, in March of 2003, Kabani orders Tolliver to be killed. He lures him to 3510 Palmetto street in the hopes that he's going to meet with uh, Coleman for some drugs they kill him in front of Coleman. And remember, Blackjack, this is a friend of Coleman's, and they wanted to harden him up a little bit. They kill him. They dump his body in a, a trunk of a car, and they clean up the, the spot. But he was now involved in a homicide, and they felt like they could be comfortable with that. Yeah, and I mean, listen, you, we talk about this in, in other episodes with guys who kind of have to earn their stripes either by going out and, and killing someone or by going and doing a bit in prison somewhere and it's it's hard to trust a guy who hasn't done either one of those things because you don't know what he's going to do when you know when the other shoe drops right like you don't know how he's going to hold up to that pressure when when ultimately he needs to so yeah they kind of staged this whole thing so that they know that hey Coleman if he wants to go and try to try to do something on his own out of you know and talk out of turn they've got one on him yeah, and you know they kind of just washed their hands of Tolliver. He had to go, and they felt like they could feel pretty comfortable about Eugene Coleman. The problem that the Savage organization would have is little did they know that the feds had wired up 3510 Palmetto Street, and they had basically heard everything that went on. Uh, by this point, Cabani had beaten the uh, – he he's still waiting on the, the murder case involving Tib Flowers back in 98. That was still hadn't went on yet, which is crazy, but that still hadn't went on. Uh, so they arrest uh, Coleman. They have enough to arrest him, the FBI. They arrest Cabani, and they hold Cabani. Cabani had broken uh, his probation for a previous drug arrest that he had. So they arrest both of them for the Tolliver stuff and put them both away. So Cabani goes away. So does uh, – Tolliver or not Tolliver uh, Coleman for the murder of Tolliver. They start Kabani basically calls home to Kadada. He says, Hey baby sis, listen, you gotta, you gotta go see Coleman. Cause we're worried about Coleman. 
Black Jesus, I think they knew Coleman was a cutout for the life. And it was their problem that they involved him. Yep. But they realized in 2003 that Cabani's arrested. He's facing probably uh, the Justice Department. He's still got a murder charge to beat. Uh, and he can't have Coleman cooperate. So he calls Kadada and says, look, you need to go up to the detention center at 7th and Arch and you need to go talk to Coleman, see what his story is. And she had, she goes up there and basically says to him, look, you're our guy. Don't fall. Don't break in here. Don't tell them anything. We're going to take care of you. We'll take care of your family. Everything's going to be fine. You just can't talk about anything. And basically say, look, you're going to have a problem if you do, but just don't say anything. Right. And for the period of time, it works. Late in 2003, they contact the, the organization contacts Coleman's brother and says, look, um, it would probably be smart to not testify at the pending federal trial of Kabani Savage and everybody else. Just tell him to not do anything. Kadada would also write to Eugene Coleman. And this is a direct quote directly from the letter. She would basically say, look, the FBI is going to try to talk shit to you, but we're all in this together. Quote, you never tell shit to them. Fuck them. Feed them dog shit. Don't say shit to them pussies. They're going to try to divide and conquer us. Don't let them divide us. She would conclude the letter with, if you said something, let us know. If you didn't, let us know. We have to know what's going on. Basically, she wanted to take the temperature of him. Uh -huh. She was worried. They were worried. She ends the letter with, don't say shit to nobody. Uh, death before dishonor to your family. I love you always, your little sis, Kadada. So they maintained that everything was fine. Again, don't say anything. Because, look, Kabani and they all knew that if Coleman testifies, they're fucked. It's that simple. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you're you going to have a guy who's going to put you in the room. I mean, that, that's that's all you need right there. This would also though, create a lot of problems because as the ball starts to roll and the shoes start to drop, people in Philadelphia start realizing they're coming after Kabani and they're going to come after Connects. They're going to come after distributors that Kabani's selling to. Uh, and that's what happened. They basically start knocking down the doors of his Connect, Juan Rosado, his other Connects, the Smith brothers down in South Philly, uh, cohorts of his. Uh, and Kabani starts to get really worried because they're really coming down on everybody and they're trying to maintain control. He knew though, that he was probably going to go away for the drugs. He knew though, he'd probably get 30 years. He'd be out in 20. Everything's fine. It's all gravy in his world. He also knew that he had to still beat the Tib flowers murder. Uh, and that was more important. I think Kabani had accepted blackjack that he was probably caught on the drugs. He just didn't want Coleman to testify because Coleman was the only one that had a murder. So yeah, he, he kind of accepted the drugs, but he knew that Coleman was was the big fish. Yeah, I mean, listen, nobody wants to take a heavy drug rap. I mean, it's not ideal, but there's a big difference between getting convicted for selling drugs and murder. OK, one you get out on one you don't. So, yeah, you, everyone knew in that was involved with this, particularly Kabani Savage, that the murder was the whole ball game. This is all that matters. And at this point, the federal government decides to do a little experiment. They decide to let's bug their cells. Let's put them all together <laughs> and let's bug the cell because they're too stupid. And they'll start talking. Uh, and in the federal prison system, you know this. If anyone that's been in the Fed, they know this. You can, you can basically drain the water out of a toilet. And you can use the toilet system as a way to communicate to other people. A lot people. of people in jails do that. Yeah. And that's what Kabani's group would do. They would all kind of be put together. And the feds decide, this is too good to be true. They're just going to start talking about shit. Um, so around early 2004, uh, they plant some listening devices in the cells. And they get some absolutely incredible uh, information. Uh, there was an individual, Craig Oliver, that was uh, possibly going to testify against Kabani Savage. Uh, Kabani would uh, contact Oliver and basically state, I can still get things done in here. 
He would also say to Oliver, uh, I'm going to melt something to uh, Eugene Coleman's daughter's face and kill her as well. Yeah. He also told uh, Oliver that he would find out where his sister had moved uh, after Kadada would follow her home from the store and, quote, kill her as well. He would also find out that other people were cooperating. He'd start looking for their uh, information as well. His connect Juan Rosado, he asked Kadada to find information on where we can find the family of Juan Rosado. Uh, and he would also continue his assault on Eugene Coleman. He knew Eugene Coleman was the guy. There was one other guy that um, was a big problem in all this, a guy, Paul Daniels. Paul Daniels was actually, from what I understand, the illegitimate son of Bubby Thomas. And he had followed his own father into the drug game. He was a uh, buyer of, of drugs from Cabani. And he had decided he was going to cooperate with what uh, as well. Uh, he was also on tape as Cabani said, so Blackjack, Cabani in, in the cell, they ask him about Paul Daniels. And Cabani basically says, Think about what he's doing uh, because you and your son will be history. I got to tell you how I feel. Everything must go. I also have a recording that I'm going to play, but this is directly from Kabani. This is what he said in reference to hearing about um, Paul Daniels' cooperation. <laughs> So basically he, and again, let me just rephrase what he said. He wants to hit one of his four-year-old sons in the head with a bat. And and that's the kind of stuff. Kabani was constantly talking about this stuff. Uh, he found out about his former cocaine supplier, Juan Rosado. Uh, he was on tape as saying, you know what it's going to cost you, your life and your mom's life. I'm going to kill your motherfucking ass. Tell the prosecutor I threaten you too, bitch. Uh, he would also find out one of his connects, Stanley Smith, was an informant. I'm going to kill everything you love, quote. Yep, he's got a daughter, too, down my way. I'm going to blow her fucking head off. She's like five. Yeah, I mean, this is, as you said at the top of the episode, some of this is hard to listen to. It's hard to talk about. I mean, this is this is monstrous shit, right? Like, even even guys in the Italian mob don't do this shit, right? I mean, like, this is... No, this is so far above and beyond what what anybody can, let alone justify, but imagine. I mean, this guy is a monster. He would also talk in depth about his obsession with not only killing the witnesses, but he would talk about he dreamed about killing the kids of these people. And he, he would also talk about his like his kids cry and those kids have to cry, too. Um, they've taken away things from him and, and, and they need to pay. And he also made a really disturbing reference as well in one of the tapes where he would always say that he's not Scarface. And a lot of people never really knew what that meant, but it was a reference to when, remember in Scarface when Tony Montana has to kill that political figure in New York and he's with that assassin and they realize that there's kids in the car yep. and Tony decides like, I'm not going to do it. Cabani would basically reference that he ain't no Scarface and that everyone was in play and that it didn't matter who you were to prevent you from testifying. He believed that if you weren't here to testify, you're not a big problem to me. Which is all well and good. And the logic there is, is I mean, it's sound, right? Like it if you're sense. if you're not available to testify, sure. But I don't know what that has to do with killing small children. I mean, you can eliminate the person testifying and not talk about bashing their four-year-old's head in with a baseball bat. Yeah, I, I guess he had realized that he can't get to these people per se, so let me try to, uh, you know, fuck with them and, and and kill people that they love and maybe they won't testify. Uh, Kabani also realized during all this that he still had to beat a murder rap uh, for Tib Flowers six years before, uh, 1998, that was still hanging over his head, but he had a pretty good idea on how to deal with that. Uh, on March 3rd, 2004, uh, after a long bout with the government, Tibius Flowers was told multiple times by the government, look, Tib, you've got to get out of Philadelphia. Okay, they're going to kill you. Tib was saying, look, I'm not worried about it. Ethan Butler's my corner. They ain't going to do shit to me. I'm fine. I'm, 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 a, I'm in a Superman. I'm good. On March 1st, 2004, um, Tib Flowers would be murdered in North Philadelphia. Guess where he was murdered at, Blackjack? That corner would be my Ethan guess. Butler, right in his car. Yep, that's... And that was 
Kabani's idea. I will skate on this murder charge. I'm probably going to get 30 years, um, but maybe I can lean on these witnesses. I can eliminate Tib and I don't have to worry about that murder charge. And maybe I could even beat the rap on this whole thing. And all this, he continues to try to get uh, Twin Coleman to not cooperate. On October, uh, in October of 2004, uh, Kabani would do something and instruct Kadada to do something that would change, I think, really the landscape of this city for a long time in, in general from a witness standpoint. And I think really has set the stage for a lot of things that went on in this city from then on. On October 8, 2004, um, the, the drug case had began. And Twin Coleman was set to testify on October 9, 2004. Uh, by this point, Kabani seen him in trial. He would make, um, you know, slashing motions with his hand and a gun under the table. And he would really try to scare Coleman. But the big day of testimony was October 9, 2004. Kabani calls home on October 8, 2004 and asked to speak to Kadada. Kadada answers the phone and she instructs Kadada to have Lamont Lewis and Merritt take care of the family of Coleman. As we know, Coleman was the guy. Coleman put him away for life, might give him the death penalty, frankly, and he would take everyone down with him. So Kabani had no other opportunity. He, he, he believed that this was his, this is what he had to do. So he instructs Kadada to take care of them. On October 8, 2004, Kadada Savage calls Lamont Lewis and orders her to, quote, firebomb that fucking house. She says to him, look, go there in the morning. I'll pay you five G's. Get rid of these people. I don't care who's in the house. Get rid of them. And the thought was, I'm going to kill his mother because we they knew that on North 6th Street between Westmoreland and Allegheny, Marcella Coleman uh, Coleman's mother lived there and that if maybe they killed his mother he would back down she was a prison guard by the way correct she was a prison guard and and it's important to understand uh, the, um, the, the the prosecutors in this case um, the, the agents that controlled this case Kevin Lewis the special agent he had told Marcella Coleman like Tim Flowers you've got to get out of Philadelphia it's pretty imperative at this point and it almost gets to the point of why didn't the FBI basically just move her? Well, um, I mean, you can't uh, listen. You can't move. I guess you against, can't just move people. You can't move them against their will. Uh, I, but it does raise the question of. I mean, like I understand. You know, they went to Marcella Coleman, and they tried to tell her to, to leave, and she thought, you know, oh, I'll be fine. You know, I can take care of this. It's my house. I've and been, why should she have to leave? She has a job. She has a home. That man. Jeff. But but let me just tell you something. If I'm sitting in a home and I have the people in that home that Marcella Coleman has in there and the FBI knocks on my door and says, listen, you are in danger. You need to leave now. I'm fucking out, dude. I'm out. Belongings, property, it can yeah, all think, be replaced. I think she definitely didn't quite, and maybe she was a bit delusional. Maybe she assumed that Kabani wasn't as dangerous as he was said, but I think, and, and Coleman, you know, I don't, I don't know if he could have got to her, um, but she, she should have left for sure. Um, she also, Kadada would instruct Lewis to once the job was done, call the phone number at the home, allow the call to go straight to voicemail without leaving a message. That would be a signifier that the job was done. She would meet him after and pay him for his duty. Uh, she would also instruct Robert Merrick to be a part of, of, of all this, and he and uh, Lewis would carry this all out. Uh, on the early morning hours of October 9th, 2004, Robert Merritt would leave his home in Norristown, Pennsylvania, and make the short trek to Philadelphia. He'd meet up with Lamont Lewis, and they would go to the home on North 6th Street. Uh, at approximately 5 a.m. that morning, uh, Robert Merritt and Lamont Lewis entered the home on North 6th Street, uh, they put gas canisters in the first floor and on the steps at 3256 North 6th Street and lit the house on fire. Inside were Marcella Coleman, the 50-year-old, 4-year-old mother of Eugene Coleman, Tamika Nash, a 33-year-old, uh, nie uh, I believe, niece of Eugene Coleman, um, his nephew, Taj Portia, who was 12 years old, 
his friend, Anthony Rodriguez, who is 15 years old, um, his sister, Khadija Nash, a 10-year-old female, and the saddest of all, uh, Demir Jenkins, a 15-month-old infant who is Coleman's son. They all died in the fire. Uh, and from what I understand, and I, I don't mean to get graphic, but I think it's important to understand the truly heinous crime that this was. Yep. From what I understand, the home at one point was a thousand degrees and they were truly cooked alive. They couldn't get out of the second floor. It was that bad. It's, um, it, it's it, truly heinous. It's just one of the worst crimes in the history. When you of the state. were describing it, 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 if you don't get goosebumps, I don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. Like it, this is, this is a god awful thing. I mean, I mean the, the thought of just hearing those people scream. These people, I mean, just, all the children, all the fucking ugh. kids, Jeff. You had four kids die in this thing. Four kids. Yeah, and all four kids. Um, keep in mind, all of the kids were under the age of 15 years old. Uh, I and mean, then two it's, grown up. I, it's unbelievable to do this. It, it, is, it is truly a staggering thing to, to comprehend. Right after the job was done, Lamont Lewis did what he was told and called Kadada, confirming that he had set the house on fire. Uh, Merritt also made a phone call distributing that it was done. Uh, later that day, Kadada Savage would meet up with Lewis and would give him $2,000 for the murders. She would instruct that an individual called Manny would give him the other 3000 At that point, Blackjack, Lamont Lewis is in not in tears, but he's very upset. He basically says to Kadada and confronts her and says, what the fuck? There were fucking kids in there. What the hell did you get us into? You told us it was just his mother, which is bad in its own right. Kadada responds with, quote, fuck him. She would then contact her brother and let him know that everything was uh, taken care of. Let me just tell you one thing. You can, you can shortchange a lot of people in your life. Um, don't shortchange your fucking hitman. OK, yeah. When you go and you wind up having four kids killed and uh, you don't tell him about that in advance, you don't give him five. You give him fucking ten. OK, you don't give him two. You don't show up light to the hitman. Yeah, that was really kind of a, a really disgraceful thing as well. I mean, not that the whole thing was an absolutely heinous, but then the short change on top of it was even dumber uh about a month later they had a vigil for the family uh the federal government permitted eugene coleman to attend the funeral of his family members um and kabani was heard on tape suggesting that the law enforcement agents that are escorting coleman that they should have gave him some quote barbecue sauce so he could pour it on them burnt bitches uh <laughs> truly uh, that's probably the worst quote of kabani savage uh which was truly disgusting uh keep in mind he would continue to say that he will kill anyone that gets in his way and it actually got to a point where he not only wanted to kill witnesses but he started getting uh jammed up with guards inside um the bureau of prisons uh there were some quotes that are pretty disgusting he stated that in one call i want to fuck this captain up i want to blow his head off i want everyone to know it too he hated everyone. And if anyone got in his way, his quote was, that's why they've got to pay. These fucking rats, their kids got to pay for making my kids cry. And you know what the staggering thing is, Jeff? Every person in a fucking jail or prison in this country knows that what they say is being recorded. Yeah. Everyone knows this. If, for those of you out there who have been fortunate enough not to receive a phone call from somebody in jail or prison. Jeff, what does it say at the beginning of every phone call? It's tapped. This call is being recorded and monitored. Yeah. And look, I, I think at the end of the day, I think the Bureau of Prisons did an absolutely horrific job at giving him phone calls. I, I don't know why he was ever permitted to be on the phone. He was that uh, much of a psychopath. Uh, Kabadi would also discuss, I have dreams about, quote, killing their kids, cutting their fucking heads off. Um, th this was a, a sociopath. It's that simple. He would also talk about the captain that he wanted to kill in December of 2004, saying that captain's a motherfucker, man. He's going to die a miserable death. And I hope I'm there. I hope I'm the cause of that motherfucker. I'm going to torture his ass. I'll set him on fire alive. That's what I want to do. I want to set him on fire. Watch him jump around like James fucking Brown. Get a metal chair and some cuffs. Douse him with gasoline and set his ass on fire. Say, welcome to hell, bitch. I'm going to get somebody that fires a motherfucker. 
This is a monster. It really is. Monster. And no other I, way to put it. He's a fucking monster. Yeah. One other comment he made, um, he found out that this guy, Paul Daniels, was still going to cooperate. He mentioned that he's going to, quote, go get Tasha's ass and kill that little bitchy baby he got as well. Tasha was a reference to his uh, girlfriend, I believe. So the, the FBI is 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 done dealing with Kabani Savage at this point. Um, now, they'd have to wait a little bit. And the interesting thing about all this was Kabani's organization was still going. Uh, Lamont Lewis was still running things on the street. Uh, people were still running things on the street. Everything was still going uh, as planned. Uh, in late 2004, Kabani would also um, tell a captain at the FDIC, FDC that, quote, he intended to kill special agent Kevin Lewis of the FBI, stating that he, quote, wanted to keep the funeral homes busy. Not quite sure why he would tell a captain that, but I guess he just assumed that uh, the cap was on his side. Again, truly a sociopath, this guy is. Poor judgment. Um, but I mean, this is, I mean, I don't know how many times I can say it. This is a monstrous human being. And, and I also just want to say one other thing. Kabani was so wild that he would literally go on these like long poetic soliloquies about dreams that he had. The, in, yeah, late two, yeah, in late 2004, he was inside with a guy, Dawood Bay, And he was talking about how, He's flooded internally from his tears of rage. Um, and he would kind of almost cry and say, these bitches are going to pay. Um, they're going to pay um, for, for everything they've done. Everyone connected them has to pay. And he waged a war on everyone and everything. And he knew um, that hopefully this would convey. The problem was um, the next day, Twin Coleman would cooperate and tell everyone everything and Kabani would get 30 years. No shit. Uh, the thing was, the FBI knew that they couldn't just give Kabani Savage 30 years. They had to cut him up for life and hopefully give him the death penalty. Keep in mind, Kabani's still inside. Kadada Savage is still on the street. She creates a website called whosarat.com and she would post who's a rat as well uh, on informant websites. So... You know, she was continuing her um, disgusting soliloquy. She also would write a letter uh, to Kabani in 2005 saying, quote, I hope all those cocksuckers die. I hope they die. Their moms, their wives, their children, their whole fucking family. Um, Kadada Savage was just as dangerous as her brother. She might have even been more of a sociopath. She was absolutely just as bad. And, you know, Jeff, we've talked, I think in one of our first episodes, we talked about the death penalty a little bit. Yep. And my feelings on it, I, I'm very conflicted when it comes to the death penalty, because as a, a libertarian, I don't believe that the government should have the right to execute people. And ultimately, that's where I fall on it is I don't think we should have it because I don't think the government has any business playing God. But man, these people deserve when you God. see a dude like this, the only thought that comes into your mind is this is why we have it. This is why it's here. Exactly. That's exactly right. In 2007, it would all end for the Kabani Savage organization. Every single person in the group would get hemmed up on uh, racketeering charges and multitudes of different other charges, including Lamont Lewis, Stephen Northington, Robert Merritt, and Kadada Savage. Um, there would be bad news for Kabani Savage. Uh, in 2007, there was a new star witness for the government. One Lamont Lewis decides to cooperate. The chief enforcer for this group, the guy that did the firebombing. And I think I got to tell you, I think there was a tinge of emotion in Lamont Lewis. He realized that he committed a truly heinous crime. I don't think, and I truly believe this. I don't think he meant to kill children. I don't. No. Um, did what he do? Was it heinous? The problem that Lamont Lewis had was if he didn't do it, he would have been murdered. It's that simple. Yeah, it is. And it, it, it's one of those things, Jeff, that like, we, we've talked on this show about some really hardened guys, some bad guys who have done awful shit. None of them have killed kids. No. Like it doesn't happen, you know? And for this guy to go out, I mean, if you, if you put yourself in Lamont Lewis's shoes and by no means is he a fucking angel, he was willing to kill a 54 year old woman who had not, done nothing wrong other than being the mother of a witness against his boss. He was willing to kill her. So he's no angel. But we all have lines, right? Like we all have a fucking line that we're not going to cross. And most people are not willing to kill four children. 
Exactly. Um, the trial wouldn't actually begin until 2012, which we'll get to. But in 2009, um, not that Cabani hasn't inflicted a lot of bad uh, stuff, but in 2009, Cabani would get some sad information. Uh, he would find out in prison that his nine-year-old daughter, uh, Ciara Savage, would be killed. Um, I actually know this because this actually happened. Ciara Savage lived in the town that I live in now, Lancaster. Um, she uh, had moved here with her mother and she actually was caught up in a drug uh, shooting in York, Pennsylvania. And a lot of people had assumed that this has been some sort of retribution for Cabani. It was later revealed by the police that it had no connection to uh, Cabani Savage and that she had just sadly been caught up in the crossfire. But um, he would get some bad news uh, with her passing. She was nine years old, uh, another small little angel of a child that killed uh, in the pathetic and pointless drug war. But uh, in 2012, uh, Kabani Savage and the, the drug organization would go to trial. Uh, jury selection would begin in uh, September of that year. And as I said, the star witness was Lamont Lewis. Uh, Kabani Savage was fucked. It's pretty simple. Uh, and it wouldn't take really that long to deliberate. The trial would go on for a while just because there were so many witnesses and there was so much, there was so much damning evidence against uh, Kabani Savage. On May 13, 2013, Kabani Savage would be convicted of 12 counts of murder and eight of racketeering, including the six murders on North 6th Street. He would also be convicted of other murders, including, I believe, Barry Parker, uh, Shafiq Abdullah, and others, uh, as well as one other count um, of uh, murder and eight of racketeering. Uh, he would also be uh, convicted of conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to participate in a racketeering enterprise, and retaliating against witnesses by murder. And in June of 2013, Kabani Savage would be given 13 death sentences, one for each witness he intimidated and killed, uh, and an extra one for witness intimidation, including those in that terrible firebombing. Uh, the sentence was pronounced by Richard Surik. Uh, Kabani Savage is still alive. He is currently on death row. He is at Florence, ADX Florence, uh, where he has very limited movement as he awaits his transfer to death row at Terre Haute. Uh, if you know anything about uh, ADX, uh, Kabani Savage uh, gets one 15 minute phone call a month, and it is only to one or two individuals. It is heavily monitored. Uh, no one is doing Kabani Savage's bidding at this point. Uh, he's a distant memory in this city. Uh, and he truly lives a hideous life. He lives in an eight by six concrete box. He has time showers. He doesn't leave his cell uh, other than an hour a week, probably. Uh, yep. He's truly living in hell on earth. And I think, frankly, at this point, death would probably be welcome to Kabani Savage. Uh, he has no life. He doesn't live in general population. Um, he is truly uh, buried under the ground. I have, I have no doubt that if if Donald Trump could have executed him, he would have, yeah. but Kabani Savage's appeals process is not complete at this point. Uh, the third circuit upheld his, his conviction and death sentence in August of last year, but he still has an appeal left with the U S Supreme court, which let's be honest is going to go nowhere. Yeah. And the truth of the matter as well is up He's until eligible to be executed yet. Yeah. And up until Donald Trump, I think since like the seventies, there've been three federal death sentences yeah, that have been carried happen. out. So it doesn't happen. Um, but I, I think it would be a better sentence to keep him in Terre Haute or ADX because it's a worse well, life. I mean, listen, Jeff, he, and, and this is what some people don't understand. Like what, cause you'll always, you always hear some, some people argue that like, Oh, you know, death is, is a lesser punishment than, than what some of these guys are getting. Do some research on, on the supermax in Florence. This is when you said he's buried under the ground. First of all, that's true. It is under a mountain. Okay. And he is confined to a cell by himself all day long. He gets one hour a week out of that cell where you are literally chained, tethered to, to ropes in the ceiling where you're allowed to walk around a track by yourself and take a shower. That's it. That's his life. Okay, there's no communication with anybody. The meals are slid in through a hole in the door. That's it. It is, uh, it is an existence that I can't fathom. Yeah, I've actually um, it, the little information you could find out about ADX. Uh, there's not a ton. There's never been videos from it or, or anything. No. It's, it's largely a, uh, a mystery. But uh, there was a guy, uh, Tom Silverstein. I don't know if you know who he is. He actually 
was the longest tenured solitary confined individual in the history of the uh, federal prison system. He actually wrote some memoirs. He's he died in 2019, but he wrote some pretty fascinating memoirs about his life inside isolation. There's a, a an area of the ADX called Range 13, and it's it's truly an awful existence. Um, you, you don't even know what day it is. There's no time. You don't know what ta- what time of the day it is. It's just an awful place. And the ADX has the worst of the worst. I mean, that's where Chapo is and Ramsey Youssef and yeah, the Unabomber. The Unabomber yep. yeah. uh, and the Boston Marathon Bomber. And ironically, a lot of the information we have about ADX Florence comes from Ted Kaczynski because he's done some interviews and he's written a lot during his time there. A lot of the information we have about Florence comes from Ted Kaczynski. So basically, the ADX was created for people like Kamani Savage. And uh, quickly, the other people involved, uh, Robert Merritt would get a life sentence. Uh, he is currently at uh, Terre Haute. He was getting a life sentence. He'll never get out. Uh, Stephen Northington got a life sentence as well. He is at USP Coleman. And baby sis, Kadata Savage, would be convicted as well. Uh, she is currently serving a life sentence as well, plus 10 years uh, down at Tallahassee. I do know uh, through just things that I found out. Kadata Savage still talks. Uh, she has no real remorse. I know she's posted some pictures on Facebook. People posted of her and she doesn't give a shit. She doesn't care. Um, she's just as bad as her her, uh, her brother. Uh, Lamont Lewis, star witness, Blackjack, his crimes are so heinous. He cooperated and still got 40 years. Um, I mean, so. Lamont Lewis was was very lucky to escape the needle himself because of that firebombing. I mean, yeah, Lamont Lewis is such under such tight scrutiny in the federal prison system. He's not even listed on the database. So what that would indicate is that they have him under an assumed name. Yeah. Um, and he's somewhere in some rat prison somewhere. But uh, yeah, they have to protect him because Lewis is a marked man. Uh, not that Kabani could get to him, but I'm sure Merritt and Northington have some interest in, in getting to him in some way. So um yeah, I mean, that's that on uh, Kabani Savage. Truly, as I said, a lot of people don't know about Kabani. Um, but in the state of Pennsylvania, I think he's probably the most dangerous person in history. I think the streets are truly safer with him off them. Um, he inflicted a ton of bad things on this city and in Philadelphia for a long time. Uh, and Surprisingly enough, he actually has one fewer murder convictions than the all-time record uh, in this state, but it's still uh, a record for uh, death sentences as far as that. And he's the only Pennsylvanian on federal death row. So we'll see if he gets the needle at some point. But Blackjack, um, putting a bow on Kabani Savage, uh, truly a heinous, disturbing, and cold individual, not only with what he did, but his his behavior and his comments surrounding uh, what he did. Yeah, I mean, you know, we talked at the beginning of the show, Jeff, about the similarities between the Cabani Savage organization and the Italian mafia. And they're certainly there, right? I mean, the way it was run, the way it was structured, the similarities are there, and that's why we're talking about him. But there is also a line of distinction, and I think this is important to talk about. You know, I don't know if you remember when when John Gotti killed Ralph Guyon for the, for the Jimmy McBratney hit. Yeah. What does Neil Delacroach tell him afterwards? You're a dead man. He tells I, I him, would be a dead man, but I, I, that's I, right. I, and I, he tells well. him it's a rule. It's the rules that keep us together, right? Yeah. There are rules because all of those organizations have rules. The Kabani Savage organization had no rules. Okay. And ultimately it was its undoing because there were no checks. It was, Fuck it. We're going to kill anybody that gets in our way. If the Italian mafia took that standpoint, they would have been eliminated 50 years ago. This is truly, I think, one of the only cases I know of in American history in a drug gang that actually went to these levels. The only people that go to these levels are cartels and uh, Pablo Escobar would do it. You don't see it in the United States. But you don't do this in the United States. You don't see it because, again, if, if you think back when we talked about Carmine Persico wanting to kill, you know, Rudy Giuliani or, or other prosecutors. They had thoughts, but they would never carry them out. It, and, because there was someone there to stop them and say, hey, if you do this, it's fucked. only going to make this worse. Yeah. Can you imagine if somebody, even a guy like Greg Scarpa or Carmine Persico, who we've talked about as being kind of unhinged dudes, 
if they would have gone and said, you know what? I want to firebomb this rat's house with his entire family in it. What would any boss have said? Absolutely not. Because you're I only think- bring press and, and attention to us. And it's going aside from the loss of life, which I don't think any of them would have tolerated. It's only going to make things a hundred times worse. Yeah. And I think really kind of the, the bow I want to put on this is weirdly enough, this actually um, became the Kabani Savage trial was actually involved in, there was a corruption case in Philadelphia back in the mid two thousands involving John street, the mayor at the time he ended up not ever being indicted, but there was a guy blackjack that was indicted in that Shamsuddin Ali Shamsuddin Ali was a former hitman for the black mafia back in the seventies. Uh, back then, his name was Clarence Fowler, but he he became Muslim and changed his name. So Shamsuddin, he gets out of jail in the, the 80s and 90s, I think the 90s, and basically transforms his image. He becomes this, you know, all about business in Philadelphia. He's going to help the Muslim community. He becomes an imam in Philadelphia, in West Philadelphia. And he has this huge mosque that he runs and he has a school that he that he's created throughout the years of being in the Black Mafia, the Sister Clara Muhammad School. And it was basically the Muslim community in Philadelphia. Shamsuddin kind of ran the community in Philadelphia. Shamsuddin would put his life all together and he would down the road become the prison commissioner of Philadelphia. This is a murderer, becomes the prison commissioner in Philadelphia. They find they start wiretapping Kabani's organization and find that Kabani and cohorts of Kabani's are talking directly to Sham Sadin Ali. And Sham Sadin Ali would also talk constantly about how he still had things going on in the streets and he actually would get jammed up. He ended up getting 10 years down the road. And I'm I'm probably going to do a corruption show later on this topic and just kind of the, the corruption we've seen in not only Philadelphia, but in Chicago. But yep. The and, and I think we've seen this in Philadelphia for the most part. And then we'll kind of end the show. Black organized crime has been allowed to operate in this town for a long time, really from the black mafia to the junior black mafia to people like Kabani Savage to Alton Coles um, to today. I mean, there are people that um, that were in the Kabani Savage indictment, Blackjack, people that were in the cell with Kabani when he talked about pouring barbecue sauce on people that are getting money from this city government to put on anti-violence rallies and shit like that. They're changed men, if you will. And look, if they are, they are. I hope they are. But this city has continued to do corrupt things with corrupt people. Uh, and it's amazing how much this goes on in America. So there was a lot of layers with Kabani after the fact with politicians and even up to the mayor at one point. So um, this was a bad individual that I think terrorized the city for a long time. So, you know, next week we'll get back to the wise guys uh, of, of Italian Cosa Nostra, but a fascinating topic today, Blackjack. We learned a little bit about the Italian mafia over in Italy and about one of the most uh, probably, would you agree the most uh, dangerous as far as a criminality drug dealer ever in America, right? I mean, I, I don't know if you can top what Kabani was doing. I don't think you can either. I think he's also by far the most disgusting individual we've covered on this show. Let me ask you, would you interview Kabani Savage if you were given the opportunity? No, I would not. I would. I wouldn't because I wouldn't want to give him a platform. I, there's nothing he can say of any value. I would just like to like know what was going through his fucking head. No, and, I don't you know, need to know he... what's going through his head. When you're talking about pouring barbecue sauce on, on yeah. four children that you've murdered, I don't need to know what's going through your head. And That's I don't true. Want, I don't want to give you a platform, right? Like we talk about, would you interview a guy like Sammy Gravano or Michael Franzese? Yeah, I would. Now, would I, you? Let me I ask don't you. Want to ask them hard questions. I don't want to know what Kabani Savage has to say about anything. So, would you interview like any serial killer or? Yes, there's to me there is a difference between people who, you know, you talk about serial killers, right? So like John Wayne Gacy, would you interview him? Because he's kind not. of like, I mean, he did a lot of really heinous. Probably not, uh, Jeff. I got to tell you, there's, a, there's, a, you know, and this was a fine line, right? When I was, when I was, a, when I was a criminal defense attorney, I always had a line with stuff. I was pretty much a whore. You could, you could rent me out if you had enough money. I didn't fuck with people that did shit to kids because that is literally yeah. like, I'm not exaggerating, dude. That is the shit that will keep you up at night. Yeah. Like that is the stuff that will cause you to lose sleep. Like, I don't want to fuck with anyone that sees a child as anything other than innocent. 
No, I remember when I when I first heard about Cabani Savage, I I I I don't really get too like a lot of that stuff like with you know like killing people. I I don't get too. It doesn't doesn't, bother me. No, but like bother me on on an emotional level. But when when you when you mention a 15 month old baby being I, I just thought about the live the screams dude, and like what fuck like, you I just thought about like the screams and like just the the terrible things that were going on it just it it makes me sick and then hearing her say fuck them you know it's just kind of it's just yeah, so dude, cold and callous this is the but worst of the worst I, yeah. I again I wouldn't want to give him a platform I wouldn't want to gain anything from it it's all just so tainted yeah it really is um but there you go, Kabani Savage and the KSO uh, here on the sit down. Uh, very interesting show. Um, again, uh, you know, we need to hear about these people. And we need to hear about some of the terror that they waged on on cities around America. But uh, next week, we'll get back into Cosa Nostra. We'll, we'll probably put out the Anthony Casso episode. I wanted to kind of uh, separate how many shows we were doing on rats because so many get, yep. people get mad that we do shows about rats uh which again we have to talk about the history but uh all right blackjack well uh that was a pretty morbid show but uh that's part of this business i guess uh great stuff great to hear from you as always uh thanks to all of you for listening make sure if you enjoy the show uh you subscribe make sure you uh, give us five stars and you comment let us know what you like about the show what you don't uh, and uh, hopefully we can continue to improve it. Uh, I'm the big man on campus, Jeff Dato. He's Black Jack Fletcher. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.